In March 2009, 25 Oxfam staff and partners from eight countries met in the Philippines with a common aim of women's economic leadership in agricultural markets programs. This exchange brought together Oxfam staff, private sector, and NGO partners. All were working to design programs for women producers and agricultural market development. Some came with strong business and markets experience, and some with expertise in gender analysis and women's livelihoods. We all work in areas where women producers have limited roles in agriculture, minimal recognition of their contribution to production, processing, and marketing, and little power. Genze Bakile is project manager for Agriculture Scale-Up in Oromia, Ethiopia. Now, the representation of women along the value chain is very, very limited. Let me cite one of the examples. Uh, out of 13,000 members of farmers, only 2.5 is the member of that union. Uh, also, uh, when you look at that leadership level, uh, only 4% represented at the General Assembly of the Union. If you look at the traders' level also, uh, only 12% is represented. Anymore, we have been supporting an exemplary experience with a uh, women's group, with a uh, coffee project, mm -hmm. and uh, the result has been very uh, very good. We are. Uh, they are uh, marketing uh, the product, but they are still uh, depending on dollars of funding. In a mixed uh, producer organization, the progress uh, for women has been hard because they are uh, involved in production, but uh, hasn't yet uh, very well involved in marketing the product. Jing Pura has been the program coordinator for gender in the Philippines, now working as East Asia Regional Change Lead for Women's Economic Leadership. So in, in the Philippines and in Mindanao, we have uh, women leaders very articulate in saying about their rights on fisheries and agriculture, but we notice that they are still poor in terms of income. Um, their active participation in civil society has not translated into uh, their better quality of life for women. The aim then was explicit commitment to build women's economic leadership. Lan Mercado is country director of the Philippines. Uh, we want women to be able to create wealth. And we want women to also lead in the transformation of power relations. The second biggest, largest population of poor people in the Philippines. Next to children, women it's the women's sector who are most poor. So for Oxfam, who professes to be an organization that's dedicated to reducing, if not eradicating, poverty, then addressing the poverty of women becomes a very significant piece of work for us. Secondly, although poor, women do contribute to the economic growth in the country. Uh, but it depends on which statistical figures you look at. If you look at the traditional ways of measuring GDP or GNP, you find that women contribute very little because those measurements look at the visible measures of economic growth and development. They look at income, they look at productivity. It never looks at reproductive work. It also doesn't look at unpaid hours of work, and it's the women who contribute that. Now, if you look at certain researches and, and studies that have devised other ways of measuring women's economic contributions, you will find that women, at least in the Philippines, contribute 47% to the growth of the economy. So with that alone, we have to recognize that women are an economic force, 
even if they are, you know, burdened by poverty, even if they are burdened, burdened by their household chores with caring for the family, they contribute and contribute a lot, almost equally, to the contributions of men. And so we are recognizing that women can change the economy. But they can only do that if they can also understand that they can change themselves. That they can also actually acknowledge that they have the power and that they can exercise that power. Thalia Kidder is Global Advisor on Labor and Gendered Economics. That we need to deal with both the social dimensions and the economic dimensions of power to be able to have women uh, really gain leadership. Sally Baden is Global Manager for the Agriculture Scale-Up Initiative. There's been two global uh, joint exchange between two global initiatives. So the board is economic leadership and agricultural scale-up. We mentioned that yesterday. So agricultural scale-up, as those of you who, many of you who work in that will already know, is about empowering smallholder farmers their livelihoods, linking them to wider markets and value chains, influencing investment, service provision and policies in favor of smallholder agriculture. Yeah? And the initiative has an ambition to impact on millions of smallholder producers across a number of countries. It was actually getting people who were very much uh, attached to their gender main mainstreaming templates and their women's empowerment templates. And we got also on the other side of the room people who were very equally attached to their agriculture templates or community-based uh, coastal resource management templates or their market templates. We got them both in the room and we talked about gender in economic justice. Changing how we work together, shifting our thinking. Household and gender analysis needed to be linked with market analysis. The group identified ways in which gendered roles in households influence women's engagement in markets. Nguyen Quan Min is program coordinator for livelihoods in Vietnam. According to our study, so men work, uh, a woman work uh, 4.5 hours longer than men. Before the visit, all participants had worked in their own country's program to integrate gender and market analysis by doing research to develop a gendered market map, a map of the market chain and market services with an analysis of women's and men's roles and power. Two uh, market and related issues, particularly market related issues with organic coffee, market related issues with honey and sesame and, and the like. Us. So after we had a discussion, so during my field visit, I contacted the union manager, uh, the board members of the producers union, uh, as well as the agriculture and uh, rural development office, the community members, including women, uh, also the cooperative office. So I came up that the representation of women along the value chain is very, very limited. Gendered market mapping also required finding out much more about the structure of markets. Although many programs had mapped a product's existing market, the change was to identify new market opportunities, new buyers and market services like finance, agricultural extension and transportation services, and the position of women. Felipe Ramiro is coordinator of the joint Oxfam Mindanao program. Now, when we did the market mapping, uh, in, in fact, a gender market mapping, what we included uh, in the in the mapping process would be to look at the disenabling environment as well as uh, the different market services that would be required to make. Uh, the value chain uh, to, to, to identify where value could be created for women. Uh, it would be very difficult to put the farmers at risk if in case uh, green energy technology would uh, not proceed with buying the seeds. So we needed to expand uh, the analysis of 
what are the other uh, markets that would be available uh, for both poor men and women who would be getting into Moringa production and marketing. So as you can see here, we're not just uh, concentrated on the, the seats, uh, but also looking at the uh, income potentials for Moringa leaves. For market uh, mapping, mm -hmm. uh, we have meeting with uh, our key partner mm -hmm. and with the beneficiaries. And we met uh, other provider services and uh, buyer and finance. It is uh, very important to have uh, the whole team involved in this uh, analysis. We have been looking for different markets mm -hmm. and uh, we are realized that uh, we can uh, look for other possibilities to help uh, the poor people in the region. Oxfam sometimes funds projects simply to get women producing a product. Where women have no role in the market, women need to get access to an existing market, participating in a market. However, we agreed that women's economic leadership means creating opportunities in the market where women can add value, where the market is growing and will increase benefits to women, and they can gain power. This requires us to look for ways to change the market system, not simply to get women producers access to selling their products. supported programs are being much more careful and intentional about selecting which market to intervene in, using both criteria about market demand and income and the potential for women to gain leadership. Herman Hishamu is the project officer for Agricultural Scale-Up, working on the local chicken project in Tanzania. Now, uh, the subsector done for Shinyanga, now the objective was to identify the subsector which was economically viable to both men and women. Now, we had a number of steps uh, which we did in selecting the subsectors. Uh, the first step was to collect relevant data from various stakeholders, from the beneficiaries themselves, and other key players uh, of development, or those who are directly or indirectly involved in the promotion of smallholder uh, farmers and producers development. So in meetings and whatever uh, with beneficiaries and other uh, stakeholders as we, you can see here. And then we went to a fourth step of doing this selection of subsectors based on developing criteria. We are going to see these uh, criteria uh, some few minutes to come. So we had to, to, to do uh, selecting the, these potential subsectors based on the criteria. So we had to do uh, criteria development first. We did a subsector selection workshop with different stakeholders as we have seen above here. And finally, we got a report and then sent the report to different stakeholders for inputs and comments and let on uh, incorporated the comments and inputs and got the final report for some sector selection. Now from this uh, from this stage here, then we went to to another stage of using those uh, criteria which were developed by task program. Now after having selected those 12 subsectors, then we went to use uh, these criteria which were developed by task role by Oxfam. N. Ravi Kumar is program coordinator for livelihoods and market access in Sri Lanka. Non negotiable criteria for the product selection. The all purple one is the specially call oriented. Because uh, for the, our power main focus is human economy has to be improved. Through the program intervention, leadership of movement should improve. Here it is the normally we are seeing, sometimes we are talking about the community development and I think that woman capacity is improving, but we never seen in the economical view. 
But sometimes we are seeing only the economic value. Not the woman got all the reasonable income. We are not worried about, we are not much concerned about coming up woman in upper level and be a leader. That these two one are non-negotiable, it's a compulsory. The third one is the possibility of considering the big number of people, either women only or more than 50%. Here I like to say it's more than 50% majority of women. Here that is the strategy. Sometimes it's very difficult to go for women only, but preferably go for women only. If not, we can consider the sector or product more than 50%. More than 50% mean it is, sometimes we might have more 51 percentage or something, it is not, but majority should be women. And other one is the less, here it is a common for all livelihood activities. And uh, less risk for the initiation of possibility of DR or consideration, whatever project which we should consider this one. And this is also non-negotiable one for all livelihood activities. And uh, should be environmental friendly, uh, market oriented product. Here the product should be market oriented. And most of the our agriculture products are by the food, people are still poor, then after producing only they are hunting for the market. And here the potential market demand, that is the same thing is again repeated. Here the, especially the woman view, here the women are facing a problem of mobility, market information and skill. Here again, when we are designing the program on the power prospectus, we have to do this thing in a, again I like to say it's a positive discrimination. The woman's side, we have to consider a little more on the mobility, concern of mobility, how they are moving and market information. Mostly women are lack on market information. They are not access to the town and other things. We have to consider that part. And the other side, they are skills. Agricultural products can be classified into types. There are local staples, bulk commodity exports, high value products for domestic markets, and those for export. The crucial factor here is that each of these types has a different power structure in the market. For example, commodities markets for export, like cotton or rice, are concentrated with large companies in transport and export. It's very hard for women to gain power. We discussed the types of markets we're engaged in. After the process of market selection and gendered market mapping, we need to identify stakeholders to work with. In addition to government and NGOs, private sector actors are crucial partners to change markets, for women as well. It's a real change in Oxfam's approach that we understand the private sector not only as a market, a buyer, but as an agent of change. And that was the private investment, the private enterprises, the markets, which actually contributes to economic development, to poverty reduction. So we developed a strategy to change, to challenge us, and to bring what we've been considering as some sort of, you know, satellite to development, right into the core of what we were doing, right into the core of all of our thinking, and right to the core of all of our strategizing. <laughs> After uh, a phone call to each of these, make sure that we will be able to bring all these uh, important people together. And then the next thing that we did is, uh, from the steering committee, she, we created a very specialized, very focused technical working groups, headed by members of the, uh, of the steering committee. So we have experts working on each of these. That's why it's a big deal, 500. Top 500 corporation, but we don't uh, need, in particular, considering that I handle the Mindanao branches group. Uh, although there are some uh, top corporations here in the countryside, but we allow our investment banking sector to handle them. So there, there are ways to argue this that are not about women's rights, and what we're suggesting is that we need to get better at arguing 
changes for women, promoting women, investments for women in economic terms and in efficiency terms. And practicality. Yes, very practical. This is not a political statement. This is not me saying we only should invest in women where it's going to lead to labor productivity and economic development. It is a tactic and it is compelling and it is can be very powerful in negotiations about all of these changes. Influencing company business models can lead to buyers purchasing more products from smallholder producers and changing practices to promote the participation of women, new roles, and eventually leadership for women in markets. Hussein Ahmed is director of Farm Organic International. Uh, working with women will benefit us from, from <coughs> the experiences that we, we observe it. Uh, women, especially on, on coffee production, are the ones which are... If we give them a training, capacity to give them a better equipment and a better way of doing with, with them uh, we, our, our, our business can be profitable for us that's an advantage the other thing is also we can be sure of the sustainable quality supply of the, the, the coffee that we're looking for and the market is also demanding and the buyers are demanding rather how do NGOs and women producers approach and talk to the private sector about promoting women? Then it's important to show that uh, if women are involved in that business, then uh, the private sector will maximize the profit. Because if we don't ask, uh, if we don't show that involvement and benefit of women will benefit that business, then the private sector will not see the importance of involving women in the business. Mirza Feroz Bey is Oxfam India's agriculture scale-up lawyer. Sometimes we are very eager with our questions, of the jumping to, the, to our interest areas and putting the, putting the uh, respondent into a hot seat like <laughs> So, not to put the respondent in a hot seat in the very instance and try to build the conversation and get the answers. Wilson John Barban is deputy administrator of AADC in Mindanao. Discuss uh, human, human, the human side of business operations. When you ask questions of who are who will do this step of the uh, the, the operations of the business, that's an easy uh, entry point for to ask whether there's uh, men and, and women. Like in the joint Mindanao program, NGOs and producer cooperatives are exploring market opportunities with various buyers of Moringa products. Moringa is a tree that produces leaves that are highly nutritious for food, feedstock, and vitamins, and seeds that oil can be extracted from for biofuels. The group visited several private sector companies. We took cassava, cassava, cancer uh, situ corn. But if we talk about malungay or maringa, that is in soybeans. Substitute for soybeans. Yes. Substitute uh, for soybeans. Cheaper because substitute. In terms of substitute, uh, it's, uh, it's a big uh, question. Yeah, because the, the top management is the one who decided. And it, it is still under study. We visited a moringa processing plant. So this is where they pulverize the dried leaves. So it all goes to this tank, uh, tank where there would be this air, air. Dried, dried air. So further pulverization. Then it goes to here where there would be filter bags to, to, to capture <laughs> whatever the, the powder form.
operating environment for a market is crucial. Danilo Sonko is president and CEO of Pinoy ME. Things will be okay. But we are here in this room right now because governments have failed to provide the business environment that will be promoting inclusive economies. We also need to identify uh, the key stakeholders and how do we how do we uh, engage uh, with them proactively, uh, lobbying and advocacy uh, uh, with the government with one of the strategies to provide not only access and control over the resources, uh, uh, but also providing an enabling environment. Growth mode. All the rest of them are, are in not only with the 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 and. Uh, also provides these services. Uh, please tell me what's the This, this ladder apparently takes about five to seven years. Different types of companies provide these services. Okay. These services then we looked at the, where, where does the, how does the ladder reach from, from micro enterprises? Okay. Well, right. The first challenge is really access to capital. The next challenge is access to market. And then finally, the next challenge is business skills. As the enterprise grows, you need to become more adept at managing your business. And that's not easy. So it's a combination of these three that we really need to put together to help the micro-entrepreneur graduate and become part of the industry. Right now, I think they're dealing with 300 uh, farmers. They want to expand, but the, the company that they're engaged with no longer wants to provide more resources because it feels that it's already fully exposed. So we're coming in to help KPMFI finance the growth of a very successful model. So there's a huge pool in the middle, which some of you will be familiar as what we, that we call the missing middle. And this is very important because it is this, uh, it is this segment which will really create entrepreneurship, the line of entrepreneurship that will bring the poor into the main street. It's making the connection between here and there. And that producers are part of the private sector, so producers, women and men, must have viable business plans that enable them to purchase the services they need. But we have to change the trend of uh, being uh, assisted or getting always a donation for the service or they getting a donation for everything. And, and our farmers, I, I believe, farmers everywhere have the capacity, the potential to, 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 to pay for the service. And if, unless and otherwise we change that service, that trend, that trend of being assisted and free service, free grant, free. They shouldn't be anything free. They are. That's when they would bend and work and, and then try to earn something. We have to change that, that trend, that kind of attitude from, the, from our farmers, especially in the case of Ethiopia, in, the, in our case, in our case, that market analysis is crucial for the success of women's enterprises. Before planting a seed or plowing a single hectare of land, you must assure a viable market. Delia Ladao is Senior Vice President, Mindanao Branches Group of the Land Bank of the uh, Philippines. I have seen how the bank fared in lending this small bank. Uh, actually, uh, before then, we lend to cooperatives as long as they have grouped themselves into 30, they have some common uh, business, then we lend. But afterwards, we found out that it's, it's not uh, that profitable. Actually, the bank has uh, written off millions of uh, our funding volumes 
because of less uh, because in learning we are the only band with uh, eight uh, these groups small groups big groups so even if we have this development assistance center we uh, find that it's not that uh, now we have changed our paradigm and we said that lending to cooperative, there should be a market first. They should be linked to a market first before we lend and at the same time strengthen their organization. So what's happening was, there wasn't the markets, the, the mind was there for the rest of all, but the system wasn't working for the local producers to be able to deliver to that market. And for those of you who've heard the story before, you know we did a lot of work with the smallholders to bring their capacity up to be able to meet the market. But that wasn't going to be enough because, you know, people's heads and also the rules and regulations were skewed against. No matter how good the quality was of the broccoli or the cabbage or whatever, or the lettuce, no matter how much they worked out, the just-in-time delivery of vegetables, Nobody was going to buy from them because they had no belief in them. So the project spent a lot of time influencing the private sector, lobbying the private sector, talking to it, convincing it, saying, try, try and buy locally. We, if you try, we can, we can prove to you that we can deliver. And of course, we did a lot of investment in proving that production and delivery side, but we got some companies to say, for it initially, okay, we'll try. And that started to snowball and convince the private sector, certain companies, that yes, okay, it worked. So from the four companies, it grew to 13 companies, and I think it's grown to over 20 companies. So there was one change, a fundamental change, in the private sector's thinking about local supply. But it still didn't address the fact that it, in certain, certain vegetables, it was still cheaper to get the stuff from the United States. So there's still a heavy bias against local producers. So we've also been working on lobbying the government in a lot of different ways about, first of all, the capacity in St. Lucia to deliver vegetables. There were, there's a classic case of where a minister responsible for agriculture didn't, he said, but you know, these hotels need lettuce and we don't grow lettuce. And we said, what do you mean we don't grow lettuce? I've just come from a farm <laughs> and they've got box loads of lettuce they can't sell. And he showed that minister that there was lettuce locally, yeah? So we had to influence the government to first understand also that there is a viable local supply, that it was the rules and regulations that needed to be changed so that the producers could actually compete in that marketplace, so changing the rules and regulations. Women's economic leadership depends on changing women's power in household negotiations. This, in turn, requires women and men recognizing women's economic contribution, increasing her income and her control of assets. Women's new market roles lead to renegotiations in families about how women and men spend their time, what work they do, and how land, money, and other assets are used by household members. As of now, the Kanawai Farmers Association, Arakapa, we have a grant for 251,000 per hug project. From? From PACAP. Philippine Australian Community Assistance Program. Do you sell the cakes? Yes, yes. Where do you sell 70 them? 70 pesos per sack, 50 kilos. And pigs? And baboy? And baboy? Oh. Like 80 kilos per kilo. 80 pesos oh. per kilo. Live, live. Live. Are there some uh, families where the man or the son doesn't want the woman to, to join or to be a leader? Nabigubang <laughs> For, for some other families, yes, it's true that um, husband would not allow their wife to be leader, but in her case, 
said that her husband allows her uh, because also it's her decision to make something to use her oh, time to be in Philippines. Because if she will just stay at home, she will have her blood pressure <laughs> 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 are, are there some uh, families where the man or the son doesn't want the woman to to join or to be a leader? Na ba ibang pamilya na wala din sa group na ang babae na leader? Pero ang bana dili, ang mga anak ay mas ganahan sila kaya ng para sa tigwan ng guro, mukha ni ko sa bahay, mas sila ko higit mahi bad ko. So mato na ang na ako ay na ako ay instinct na matugo na ako higikalingawan. For for some other families, yes, it's true that the um, husband would not allow their wife to be leader, but in her case, she said that her husband allows her uh, because also it's her decision to make something to use her oh, time to be in Philippines. Because if she will just stay at home, she will have her blood pressure <laughs> <laughs> high pressure. <laughs> yeah. How many hectares? One hectares. You own a mong bana mo Naya kung yot tapo dito sa Kicharaw, 3 hectares. Three hectares. Ah, kabahin na po na ako na sa akong experience. Sa, sa ako na ng pangalan. Ibahin naman na ako sa akong. She inherited the tree. Muna yung kung kaman dito moring ka. Ah, okay. No, three, three hectares? Three mo hangalan? Okay. Next, no municipality? She has a three hectare land in her name, which she inherited, which she planned to plant the moring ka. Uh -huh. Do your sons like to cook? Yes. What do they cook? Uh, vegetable, fish, uh -huh. etc. Yeah. Sinos. And who who likes to wash clothes? My. Kato mo, anak yung lalaki? Lalaki, the little one here a while ago. <laughs> How old is he? 31 years old. The eldest yan na. Ang pila edad? 31. 31 years old. So, we're strong. A strong leader, like for me. I have a strong leader. What does this mean in practice? What will change about how we design programs? We agreed that we will need to strengthen the focus of women's economic leadership in Oxfam's market development methodologies. We need to revise our monitoring indicators to strengthen our evaluation of what interventions are working to build women's leadership. What I learned in the past five days is that we really have to think about arguments or putting a business case for women's economic leadership because of the broader stakeholders that we are trying to engage now. And I think at the heart of it would be the producers, especially the women and cooperatives that support them, they should be able to advocate that they have a business case for involving women in the economic enterprises that they're doing. Plus, as an instrument to uh, evaluate the impact of the program in the, in the in the women, in the capacity of women to integrate in the value chain. It enriched my, uh, my learnings on the fuel, and this can be used as our input in programming our, our regional-wide uh, gender program. And this can be integrated also in our uh, activities in the, in the communities. My biggest learning, I think, is in the theory of efficiency and using the efficiency arguments. Uh, it, it is something new uh, for, for me engaged in sustainable livelihood programs. Um, I find it really helpful um, to use it uh, in, in, in the sustainable livelihood work that we do. Uh, because it was one, um, it will strengthen um, our um, plan already to, um, in our gender mainstreaming work and also in our targets uh, on women empowerment uh, and also transformation of uh, policies and uh, practices. So I think I, I, I find it useful uh, on a general, general basis. And I really hope that I could you know, have more practical ways of using the efficiency arguments because and, uh, for now it's still a bit um, general for me. But I'm looking forward to more specific you know, using it as a tool um, that uh, I, I could use, or even my colleagues in Oxford could use actually, for, uh, in our partner's work and working with the